Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Lynette Roth, and I am Diamond Curator of the Bush Reisinger Museum and head of the Division of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Harvard Art Museums, and I will be serving as moderator for our Q&A later on today. Before we begin today's program, the Harvard Art Museums acknowledge that Harvard University is situated on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Massachusetts people, and we at the university strive to honor this relationship. I want to thank you all, uh, so very many of you, uh, for joining us this week uh, for our latest session in the series, Our Talks Live. Uh, in which we offer an up-close look at works from the collections with our team of curators, conservators, fellows, and graduate students. And you can join us on Zoom every other Tuesday at this time, 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, for these short interactive talks. And we, uh, in these talks, investigate uh, artist materials and techniques, reveal our latest discoveries, offer a fresh look at old favorites, and explore big ideas using the collections of the Harvard Art Museums. And uh, for those of you who are new to our sessions, uh, just a reminder that we are using the webinar format in Zoom. So you can submit your brief questions in the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. The presentation will be uh, roughly 18 minutes or so, and then we'll dedicate the remaining time to the Q&A. Uh, and we will take those questions uh, then at the end of the presentation and conclude the talk today at around uh, one o'clock. So now I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today, Laura Muir. Laura is Associate Director of Academic and Public Programs and Lewis Miller Thayer Research Curator at the Harvard Art Museums. Laura was also the curator of our fabulous 2019 Centennial Exhibition the Bauhaus and Harvard, and she's also the editor of the accompanying catalog, which I'm thrilled to say is now available for pre-order through Yale University Press. And the catalog, which of course is appearing after uh, the exhibition, uh, really gets into a new research on our Bauhaus holdings by emerging scholars uh, in the field, uh, international, uh, scholars as well, conservators and faculty that also taught with the exhibition when it was on view at the Harvard Art Museum. So really a lot of new and exciting material, which Laura has uh, painstakingly worked uh, to pull together. And uh, we're thrilled today to really take a deep dive with Laura into a single photograph by uh, Lucia Maholi. Um, of the Bauhaus living room. So with that, uh, I turn it over to Laura. Thank you so much, Lynette. I'm really delighted to have the chance to discuss an object that is part of the Bush Reisinger Museum's extensive Bauhaus collections at Harvard. It is a gelatin silver print photograph by Lucia Moholy of a domestic interior. It measures about six and a half by nine inches. So it's about the size of an iPad. And it was printed from a glass plate negative that Moholy had exposed in a large format wooden view camera mounted on a tripod. The seemingly straightforward object is one that I have returned to again and again, which is partly why it is the image, the cover image of our new publication, The Bauhaus, Object Lessons, The Bauhaus and Harvard which along with the Bauhaus exhibition I curated at the Harvard Art Museums in 2019 was part of a global initiative to mark the centennial of the founding of the Bauhaus. And for us, a chance to take a fresh look at our collection and objects like this. Moholy's photograph also seems an appropriate object to contemplate at a moment when many of us are spending a lot more time in our own domestic environments all the more attuned to our surroundings at home and what makes the space work. The photograph depicts a spare, clean, airy, and light-filled living space furnished with modern furniture and design objects. It was made in Germany around 1927, and it is part of a series of photographs by Lucia Moholy documenting the interiors and exteriors of the residences 
designed for the faculty of the Bauhaus. And the Bauhaus was a pioneering school of modern art, architecture, and design active in Germany between 1913, 1919 and 1933, when it was closed under pressure from the Nazis. Founded by architect Walter Gropius, who you see on the left, Shortly after World War I, it was fueled by a post-war utopian desire to rebuild, to create art, objects, and environments that would revolutionize everyday life and revitalize society. The school combined a fine arts academy and an arts and crafts school and was organized into workshops, so metal, glass, textiles, pottery, and so on, where students learned specialized skills while also working to develop prototypes for industry. These objects would then ideally be mass produced and sold at affordable prices. At least that was the goal. In 1925, the school moved from Weimar, where it was founded, to Dessau, where the iconic Bauhaus building was constructed, which you see on the right. In addition to this innovative school building, Gropius designed housing for himself and the senior members of the school school's faculty, also known as the Bauhaus Masters. And I also want to mention, mention that housing for students was incorporated into the Bauhaus building itself um, in the studio building, which you see on the right of the screen here. And some of the luckier students uh, scored spots in this dormitory. But here is a plan of the faculty housing, the director's house on the far left, and the three double houses occupied at least initially by the families of faculty members, Laszlo Moholinaj, Lionel Feininger, Georg Muka, Oscar Schlemmer, Vasily Kandinsky, and Paul Clay. Lucia Moholy and her husband, the Hungarian constructivist artist, Laszlo Moholinaj, occupied half of the first double house on the left, which you see highlighted here. The couple had come to the Bauhaus in 1923 when Maholi Naj was hired to lead the metal workshop and the preliminary course required for all stu students entering the program. Lucia Maholi, who you see in this wonderful self-portrait from 1930, she was also a very gifted portrait photographer, was born in 1894 in Prague, where she studied art history and philosophy at university. She then worked as an editor at various publishing houses in Germany and as a journalist and began to experiment with photography alongside Moholy Naj in 1922. In Weimar, she apprenticed at a photography studio and began work as a freelance photographer. Some of her earliest subjects were the objects produced in the various Bauhaus workshops which were then often reproduced in the school's promotional materials. And you see on the right, the Bauhaus catalog of designs, which was used to market prototypes to industry. In Dessau, Moholy produced hundreds of photographs of the new Bauhaus buildings. And you see two examples here, recording the building's signature cantilevered balconies and glass curtain walls, hallmarks of modern architectural design. Maholi's sober, precise, and straightforward approach, which emphasized the materials, forms, details, and structure of her subjects, allied her with the new objectivity photography of the period and set this work apart from the often defamiliarizing and experimental new vision photography that her husband and many others at the Bauhaus were practicing at the same moment. Maholi's photographs were widely reproduced in the press and in the Bauhaus's own materials. And you see two examples here with her photograph here and here reproduced. This was a natural extension of Maholi's work of photographing the Bauhaus objects just on a bigger scale. This was simply the largest product produced thus far and Maholi understood the value these photographs had in promoting the Bauhaus and its image. Likewise, the faculty residences, in addition to providing housing, were important publicity tools. They were the subject of tours for journalists, a documentary produced by the Humboldt Film Company entitled, How Do We Live in a Healthy and Economic Way, and many photographs. 
In addition to documenting their exteriors, Moholy devoted considerable energy to photographing the interiors, focusing most extensively on the director's house, which you see on the left. And here's a view of one of the interiors of the Gropius residence, as well as the half of the two family house she shared with her husband, Moholy Naj. So this was Lucia Moholy's living room where she and her husband lived and worked and entertained, but it also served as a showcase for Bauhaus aesthetics and design. It was furnished with objects produced in the various workshops, including three examples of tubular steel furniture designed by Marcel Breuer, the club chair, a side chair, and a stool, as well as a store, storage unit also designed by Breuer that housed books as well as a compartment for a typewriter on a retractable ledge. And you see that typewriter tucked in right here. Near the center of the photograph, its white shade accentuated by the black screen behind it is a glass table lamp designed in the metal workshop by Wilhelm Wagenfeld and Karl Jakob Bücher. Moholy had used the same screen in an earlier photograph in which she had positioned her husband clad in dark coveralls in front of the white panel of the folding screen. And on the far wall, we see one of Moholy Naj's abstract paintings. This work now in the collection of the Bauhaus archive in Berlin reminds us not to forget about the color in the room. The painting with its palette of primary colors perhaps matched the tulips on the coffee table or the cushions or the upholstery of the tubular steel furniture, which was available in a range of colors. Part of Moholy's challenge was to effectively translate this into black, white, and gray. What Moholy's photograph also does is take all these elements, art, architecture, and design, and shows how they fit together to create a harmonious, coordinated whole. A total artwork, or Gesamtkunstwerk. Moholy's composition is a carefully calibrated volume and space construction, not unlike the ones her husband had his students make in the preliminary course in which Moholy extensively photographed. And here you see an example on the left. But life size. Her photograph is the result of multiple decisions, subtle shifts, and interventions to create a perfect balance. The subtle angling of the club chair here and the strong vertical of the bookshelf with a flower vase on top of it and the dark rectangle of the stool here mirror elements of the painting that hangs on the wall. The oblique angle of the photograph makes the room feel more spacious and welcoming. And Moholy's skillful use of light and shadow allows her to incorporate the large windows, otherwise impossible to show from this angle and the generous amount of light and healthy fresh air they could admit. Moholy had photographed many of these objects separately. Bauhaus scholar Robin Schuldentry has compared these object photographs to Moholy's portrait photographs, noting that they served as professional portraits of the objects. Moholy's photograph of her living room might then be seen as a kind of group portrait, bringing together these architectural and design friends in a convivial conversation, precisely the kind of ensemble that the Bauhaus aspired to achieve. Other photographs in the series shed light on Moholy's process and the way she manipulated the interior's furnishings and decor to achieve her pictorial goals. A pendant photograph also in Harvard's collection shows the room from the opposite direction and permits a view into the adjacent dining room. In addition to moving the vase of tulips from the coffee table to the top of the bookshelf, she has extended the typewriter ledge and positioned the stool beneath it. In other photographs, she experiments with hanging various paintings by Moholy Naj on the long wall above the sofa. Despite the skill involved in producing an image like this, there was a perception at this time that architectural photography was simply a document of what was there and not the product of an artist. 
And when these photographs were reproduced, it was not uncommon for the architect alone to be credited. Today, we value this photograph as a work of art in its own right, but for much of its life, it was viewed and used primarily as a tool. I'd now like to turn to the physical object itself and see what it can tell us. You may have been wondering about the smudges at the top of the photograph. This is from retouching and subsequent abrasions of that fragile opaque watercolor surface. The retouching took place in connection with the reproduction of this photograph. The back of the print bears many marks, inscriptions, stamps, and labels that tell us much about the life of this object and the work that it did. In addition to the artist's stamp, which you see very faintly here, and her inventory number, which indicates that this was printed by Maholi from the original negative, there are instructions for the retouching. At the top right, the top right it reads, retouch out the lights in German. And as you can see, in these before and after views, the light fixtures on the ceiling have been duly removed. Maholi's view of the living room from the opposite direction was subjected to even more aggressive retouching. As you can see here, the lighting fixtures were removed from the ceiling while the pillows on the bench were significantly edited. The retouching instructions on the back of the print specify that from the original jumble, only two pillows remain, the others are retouched out. And there's a quick sketch of the two remaining pillows. So what was this about? It was more than just an artistic or editorial choice. The removal of the pillows and the light fixtures seems to relate to an idea that clutter and comfort were at odds with a modern home. This concept was addressed by the architect and Gropius's friend, Bruno Taut, in his influential 1924 book, The New Dwelling, A Woman as Creator, the title evoking the idea of home and homemaking being a woman's domain, while the discourse itself remains male dominated. In the volume, Taut described how the well-meaning housewife tries to create a cozy, agreeable atmosphere herself and her husband, with all kinds of paintings, mirrors, coverings, curtains over curtains, cushions on cushions, carpets, box, photos and souvenirs, knickknacks, and so on. His book illustrates how interiors could be simplified and streamlined, decluttered, showing a space in its original state on top and after it had been reformed on the bottom. The reworking of Moholy's two photographs correspond exactly to the way they were reproduced in Walter Gropius's book, Bauhaus Building Dessau, which was published six years later in 1930, and which appeared as the 12th volume in the series of Bauhaus books. The publication surveyed Gropius's architectural projects in Dessau, including the Bauhaus building and master's houses. Lucia Moholy, who had worked on many publications at the Bauhaus and had a background in publishing, helped edit the volume in which over 50 of her photographs are reproduced, along with the work of numerous other photographers. Gropius's accompanying text, echoing his friend Tout, suggests that the problems of the, again, overwhelmed housewife will be solved by throwing away the useless objects and ornate furnishings acquired in pursuit of an outdated notion of coziness or gemütlichkeit, and by embrace, embracing the clean, efficient, and rational domestic environment of the new dwelling. The notion that we can improve our lives by simplifying and decluttering a la Marie Kondo is still very much alive and relevant today. The link between modern streamlined designs and health also resonates in the age of COVID with our desire for clean, sanitized, safe spaces. And it's worth contemplating the role of artists like Lucia Moholy in, help, in helping us to envision this ideal, even if it is, in this case, a retouched fantasy vision of modern living. The Bauhaus sought to make this kind of environment, a vibrant modern lifestyle it represented accessible to everyone. 
But in fact, very few people lived like this, even at the Bauhaus. These homes were more like luxury villas, much larger than what the average person could afford. And many of the design objects, the glass table lamp, for example, were not mass produced utilitarian objects, but one of a kind um, expensive items. Maholi and her husband would only occupy this home for about another year until 1928, when they left the Bauhaus and Joseph and Ani Albers moved in and redecorated to their own taste. The space depicted in Maholi's photograph was thus short lived, but had a long afterlife as an image being reproduced extensively, but increasingly without acknowledgement of the artist behind the image that she is credited here, photo Lucia Moholy slash Berlin, where she was then living, is not surprising given her involvement in editing the volume. Once Moholy Lot was no longer in control of her images and how they were reproduced, however, she was often uncredited. Following the publication of Gropius's book, Moholy's photograph of her living room and many like it remained in the architect's personal archive and continued to be reproduced. Shortly before his death in 1969, Gropius donated his architectural archive to Harvard's Bushreisinger Museum, which was home to a large Bauhaus collection that he had helped to establish after World War II. But it wasn't until 1981 that Issa Gropius donated the related photographic archive her husband had amassed in connection with this work. Although Maholi's photographs around 200 vintage prints are now considered to be a cornerstone of Harvard's Bauhaus holdings, for many years her prints and those by other photographers in the Gropius archive were still cataloged under Gropius's name until a recent Bushreisinger Museum initiative to correct this. In our 2019 Bauhaus exhibition, Maholi and her work were foregrounded. Her photographs appeared in multiple places throughout the exhibition. Here you see some of her views of the Bauhaus building. And her photograph of her living room was displayed in a section devoted to the domestic interior where it helped illuminate the connections between design objects, photography, and advertising. Over the years, a handful of scholars and Lucia Maholi herself worked to recover and reposition this work, but only recently has it begun to receive the attention it deserves and is now the subject of a wave of important new scholarship and interest. Thank you so much for joining me today to take a close look at one small part of Maholi's achievement. In closing, I'd like to invite you to further explore Maholi's work and our larger Bauhaus collection by visiting our online resource where you can access information on the 32,000 Bauhaus related objects at Harvard. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, while you were talking, the chat or the Q&A has been filling up with questions and I was doing my best to answer the most uh, straightforward of them. Uh, I would love to kick it off actually kind of where you wrapped up your talk. We had a question about um, Lucia Moholy's uh, seemingly limited uh, representation or reception until now and this more recent resurgence. And you just touched on that in the end of the talk as regards sort of the status or the treatment of architectural photography. Uh, and photography more generally, but I was hoping you could maybe say a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, it's true. This isn't something that has just been discovered now. You know, in the um, 90s, um, Rolf Sachse um, published a wonderful um, catalog raisonné of Lucia Moholy's photographs, which is like what everyone still goes back to um, now. Um, and as I mentioned, Lucia Moholy herself was um, kind of actively promoting her work and her, her legacy, but with that wasn't in possession of the actual photographs for um, a long period of time. Um, and I want to shout out um, to Robin Schuldenfrey, who wrote a really wonderful essay in 2013 called Images in Exile, Lucia Moholy's Bauhaus Negatives and the Construction of Bauhaus Legacy, because that's been a really 
important work in kind of um, bringing attention back to, to Lucia Moholy. And since then, there have been numerous um, dissertations um, that touch on Lucia Moholy's work and other um, articles and publications. And I believe that there's a major um, exhibition um, in the works um, as well. But I think that has come about, um, as you mentioned, um, kind of a, an interest in the medium of photography that kind of had, had a revival in the, maybe in the 90s and um, more recently, as we start to look at some of the um, media that has sort of been overlooked in um, Bauhaus scholarship, the textile workshop, for example, but also photography, but also the work of women artists. There's been a lot of great new scholarship um, looking at gender in the Bauhaus. Great, thank you, Laura. Um, and that sort of uh, leads me to the next question, uh, which has to do with what you've pointed out as kind of the fantasy of uh, this kind of dwelling. And we actually had a lot of questions in the chat about the various retouchings. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you could actually just point us to a few of those, um, maybe using your, your cursor, um, mm -hmm. You had mentioned uh, the use of uh, watercolor, but then also the later uh, retouchings of the lamps and the, the ceiling. Yeah, so that's, um, it's an opaque watercolor. So it's sort of like a, a white um, material that um, was applied kind of with like, a, sort of like a sprayed on, kind of almost like airbrushed on. Um, and you see that, most um, obviously here, and it, you know, it's more obvious because of these abrasions um, to, to the surface. I think otherwise you wouldn't have really realized that there, there were um, light fixtures underneath. I'm gonna just go back to um, the images of, of this room here, because I think this is a little more obvious where you know, these, these pillows were retouched out the ceiling fixtures, you can actually see like a little bit of a, the ceiling um, fixture up here. Um, and this is actually a more modern print, but part of the Gropius archive that was, um, you know, continued to use for reproduction. And I noticed just recently that the radiator that used to be here has been retouched out. So there was just sort of like widespread, um, um, retouching of, of these, these photographs um, in connection with, with their publication. Yeah, and one of our participants has just pointed out, you know, that that is kind of that, uh, what you've addressed is also that incredibly um, wonderful contradiction, right, between the sort of trying to achieve the, the goal, the sort of aesthetic, uh, and, and really what, you know, the dwelling space actually looked like. Right, and what, what you needed to be able to see and um, and do do your work. I mean, yeah, it's it's kind of really reworked to achieve these pictorial goals in you know in the print version of the, the photograph. And I think that's what's so exciting about your work, Laura, is really you know the way that you are looking at the photograph as a material object, and you know also you know paying attention actually to the work that happens you know in the the phase you know prior to publication, um, but also what the object itself you know the physical object of the photograph uh, can tell us. And a lot of our our participants also had questions about color and what we know about what color would have been in this space and if there are any um, uh, color images or, or um, drawings, representations um, that you know, could help us think through Bauhaus and color. Yeah, I have to thank my colleague Lauren Hansen for um, bringing up that, that question of color. And I have never seen any color photographs of um, the Moholy residence. There are some color images of the Gropius residence, which can give you a, a sense of that. What, um, you know, we know for sure the colors of the painting, um, which is in the collection of the Bauhaus archive. Um, but everything else, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, the, you know, you can speculate that the upholstery of this club chair or the side chair might have been colorful because they made 
um, this canvas material, upholstery material in colors like, you know, it wasn't just black and gray, it was also orange and blue. Purple. Um, <laughs> purple, yes. So, um, yeah, so it, I think it's really interesting to, to think about, um, you know, we really understand the world of the Bauhaus through these black and white photographs, but there was actually a lot of color happening in the interiors of the, the homes were um, painted wonderful colors. And um, probably a lot of the audience knows that the Bauhaus building and the master's houses are still standing, um, have, been, have been renovated and preserved and are really um, an incredible um, resource and um, you know place that you can still visit. And I did, just want to mention thinking about the uh, photograph as an object, it was really exciting to be able to look at the, the versos of these photographs. I mean, I think everyone who's involved in looking at photographs always wants to see what's on the back of a photograph. And often in a museum, these are, you know, photo cornered or mounted into a mat. And it's, these versos aren't necessarily accessible, but I don't think this photograph was ever in a mat or ever exhibited until we showed it in 2019. And until then it was just in a kind of a plastic sleeve and you can really access the back of it and, and try to kind of puzzle out all of these many inscriptions that kind of tell us what, what this um, photograph has been through. And I'll use that as a plug for when the Harvard Art Museums reopen uh, to visit the Art Study Center. And Laura also leads our Art Study Center seminars uh, online and uh, again um, someday in, in person. And that really is a great opportunity to view works uh, like Maholi's photograph uh, in the Art Study Center and actually be able to um, uh, have that experience of, of turning it over and seeing what information uh, you, can, you can see when it's not on the wall of the exhibition. So Laura, we have so many questions, a lot of very general Bauhaus questions and uh, questions about architecture and the impact on uh, architecture in the United States. But I think uh, we will send all of these questions to you and we're going to have to wrap it up uh, for today. And maybe that means we just need to have another Bauhaus uh, art talk in the future. Uh, I really want to thank you, Laura, for uh, your incredible presentation and thank everyone for joining us today. You will get a short online survey sent to you after this, and we do hope that you take a moment to complete it, especially if this is your first time joining us for Art Talks uh, Live. And I hope you will join us again in two weeks time uh, to hear from uh, Makita Best, our Richard Elemental Curator of Photography. So that's on March 9th. Uh, and Makita is going to be talking also about photography. Her talk, Reframing Photographic Histories at the Harvard Art Museums, uh, will actually touch on many of these issues around uh, the reception and understanding of photography. And her talk, launches a series of related to a museum-wide initiative that Makita has also spearheaded entitled Reframe. And in that initiative, the Harvard Art Museums are reimagining the function, role, and future of the University Art Museum. And that series of talks is going to run until early June, and it will examine difficult histories, foreground untold stories, and experiment with new approaches to the collections of the Harvard Art Museums that reflect the concerns of our world today. So of course, you can always visit us online and check out our calendar for more information about these and upcoming programs. And we really hope to see you again. And thank you again, Laura. Thanks so much, Lynette. Thanks, everyone. Bye.